as I mentioned earlier, we'd organized this event around uh, Mandy Ness's book, Southern Insurgency, and we've just heard uh, three commentators uh, raising some, uh, some, some, some of their thoughts on the book. Um, and I'll just briefly introduce him now. Um, uh, so Emmanuel Ness is professor of political science at the City University of New York. Uh, his new book, Southern Insurgency, The Coming of the Global Working Class, is published by Pluto Press. Uh, he is also author of uh, Guest Workers in U.S. Corporate Despotism and Immigrants, Unions, and the New U.S. Labor Movement, as well as numerous articles in the academic and popular books on labor, worker insurgencies, community, public, and social health, and trade unions. Uh, he's the editor of the International Encyclopedia of Revolution and uh, also a working USA Journal of Labor and Society. Uh, and he's traveled a long way and endured some ordeals, I guess, at uh, at least two different airports today. So, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, call me Manny. Um, I think I'm going to speak extemporaneously. I think I know the book fairly well. Uh, I would have been interested in listening to the comments because I was trying to figure what they might have been, and so maybe I will start there. Uh, I think people have a certain sense of what the book is about. It's primarily uh, a, uh, in some ways, a polemic uh, that I think is necessary as a form of intervention uh, with respect to understanding uh, the transformation of global labor over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Of course, others have written about it, and I was very much motivated through my work in a number of countries, including India, South Africa, and a few other places, uh, by uh, the stark recognition of a divided class system across uh, countries. Um, and within this context, the division of uh, wealth and so forth between the global north and the global south is palpable, including places like China, where we, we take a look at the uh, realized surplus value is extreme levels of extraction uh, that are obtained from most industrial workers uh, in terms of uh, international capital. Of course, they're also exploited by state capitalism in China as well. Um, and so uh, I'm also intervening in the discussion about uh, the uh, number I think many would agree that in fact there's been a lot of research and a lot of writing done on post-capitalism. Um, uh, for instance, uh, Paul Mason's work, uh, which uh, came out about a year ago, where he examines uh, a post-capitalist system that is going to emerge somehow without any kind of social movements. And I think that's it's extremely important to recognize that it's, uh, you know, first of all, it's not going to happen that way, and it doesn't remind you about it. But this is part of a long history of research and publications that go all the way back to Daniel Bell and Andre Gortz, if not earlier, where there is a assumption that, in fact, there really isn't a revolutionary working class, and that the working class is, in some cases, a backward force within society. Now, of course, uh, not recognizing that the working class is comprised of people of color, is comprised of women, and so forth, including the industrial working class. Uh, at the time in the United States and Western Europe and so forth and so on. And so I, I'd like to go to a, a very important point, and this is the nature of production that is producing uh, at products for the uh, West, but also for the South as well, the global North as well as the South, uh, where much of the profits is actually this, uh, accrues in major financial centers, uh, such as uh, London, New York, Hong Kong, etc. Uh, so in, in many instances, if we take a look at the profits that are created, they are being created by a certain kind of labor, uh, which I think may not be so different than what existed in the West before, and that is the notion of a informal, uh, a contract labor system that is in place in virtually every one of these countries, largely as a consequence of foreign direct investment, but not exclusively. There's also state investment and local capitalists uh, who invest in these countries. But uh, it occurred to me, and I think it's not just I, but many others, people like Jan Bremann, uh, who has written extensively on footloose labor, that uh, in fact, uh, labor is constantly in a process of proletarianization Contra to the work that uh, has been put forward by Guy Standing in his book, The Precariat, and that um, 
the nature of a proletarian workforce, an industrial workforce, is one that is highly unstable, one that is in the process of uh, high levels of exploitation, largely recent uh, urban uh, residents who had um, been living in the countryside and in many contexts peasant laborers, and many in fact go back to the peasant lifestyle after they complete the work and uh, work in a kind of cyclical fashion in a way I think that Jan Bremen puts forward that it's a footloose labor force. And I would argue that this is the norm in, uh, in this way. I would say that if we take a look at most industrial labor in the global south, uh, it is highly unstable. And for instance, we, I think it was unprecedented the degree to which there was a celebration of the Indian general strike last week, or earlier this week. Uh, it made a lot of press and so forth, and I, I think it's, that's good. And, and However, I would apply a critique to it that for the most part, we're talking about contract workers who were part of that strike, but they didn't necessarily strike because they were going to gain anything as a consequence of it. Uh, they struck, struck because they had to, because the full-time workers went on strike and the plants shut down. And if you go to most factories in the industrial belts of India and elsewhere, uh, not as much in China, but it's there as well, you find that most laborers do not have full-time jobs. They're not even registered with their employer frequently. And they make up the bulk of the, work, the working class in India, I would say some 400 million out of five, 600 million people. Uh, and it, as such, I think it's very important to recognize a strike as something that was top-down to a large extent uh, and did not really call for the end of contract labor as a central demand. That was seven or eight down. It was increasing wages and uh, other uh, demands that were made by by full-time workers. Not to say that they're all, not also exploited. They certainly are. Uh, and so in, in some ways, you know, when I'm doing this research, I've done a lot of work around um, Delhi and in the auto industry as well in Chennai, as well as Delhi and Haryana. Uh, and I found that uh, to a very large degree, uh, some of my research findings have a different perspective even in the more recent research that may not be reflected in this book. So for instance, the very well-known Maruti Suzuki strike was one that was led by full-time workers. And that um, the only reason why it was so successful is because their major demand was that contract labor come to an end. Um, of course, now I'd just like to make a, a, so I would say as a general point, and I think it's fairly clear, it's probably true in the United States, I don't know Canada, but I think it's important to recognize, I'd like to learn about it, that in the United States, Historically, there also has been a form of informalization. Uh, even, and uh, I think Sam would be, perhaps, to comment on this, that to some degree, we take a look at garment sweatshops, which were at their apogee in the 1960s, 50s, 60s, 70s. They were sweatshops. People came and went. People worked odd hours. They were contemporary, part-time, and so forth. And in some ways, there are some parallels between the kind of, the term, I guess, that Sandy uses precarity that exists back then and would exist today only in a different form in a uh, post-industrial global north to a large extent, not exclusively. I'd like to make another, I was trying to uh, guess what people would criticize the book because I, I, might, I think I'm highly critical of my own work as well. I would say one of the most important critiques would be the question of agency. Uh, and uh, it would raise the question of spontaneity as well and I think that's quite important because largely speaking, uh, the three cases that I look at with respect to uh, South Africa, uh, with respect to India and China, they are really by and large spontaneous strike movements which do not have leadership. And you know, I go back to your recent article that you wrote for Jack and I thought that was very well, I like the critique of unions and social movements. And I don't, and I agree, I, I, maybe we have a conversation about that social movements on their own um, are spontaneous and they cannot really solidify the gains in a, a systemic manner, in a comprehensive manner. And for that reason, uh, as the, question, the comment of the day, I think you do need a political organization. I, I, I've reached the conclusion, I'm critiquing my own work, that spontaneity is not enough. It just is not enough to have a recognition of a mass strike that takes place, for instance, in Dongguan, China, amongst Weiwen workers who are making athletic shoes, uh, Adidas and so forth, 
uh, where 40,000 workers sit down, yes, we can celebrate that, and it's a momentous event, but there's really no, as you know, aside from the AFCTU, there's really no party to, or political even union to back it up, but unions as a whole will not necessarily put forward a, nor should they necessarily, a alternative uh, political ideology on their own. And, you know, certainly the same could be said, and I'm just going very quickly through this because I only have 20 minutes, the same could be said for the South African case, although that was, you know, I guess we can still be hopeful about South Africa to some degree, but there really isn't any alternative, uh, I don't mean to quote uh, Thatcher, there isn't any uh, alternative party to the ANC and, uh, and the uh, SACP. Uh, that they, the left really has not solidified uh, any kind of political movement, uh, not to say they haven't tried, and that takes, I think, uh, uh, a, a sustained effort that I don't necessarily see at this point there. Uh, but certainly the mine workers' strike was the most important strike in my mind in the mining sector over the last 10, 20 years anywhere, and maybe even in any industry in the last five years the 2014 strike in which a entire uh, union structure was taken down, the National Union of Mine Workers in South Africa, which was a significant part of the ANC SACP leadership. Uh, so I, I would say that, uh, yeah, there, I don't see there's an, I, I necessarily yet, I think there's some very important leaders like Urban Jims and, and um, Zwan Zima Bobby and so forth, some very principled people, but they have not, you know, they have created the Workers' Summit and so forth, but I hope that will lead to something, but there's also the other side of things that it could also lead to a reassertion of white power, as we've seen in the most recent elections, where the DA and the Democratic Alliance seem to have gained some significant victories. Um, you know, just going back to uh, the, um, the, the reason for optimism, I think there's a, my time is up, so I think there is a great degree of optimism potentially, and I, I would argue that uh, on the question of spontaneity, because I'm just thinking that perhaps it was discussed, uh, that um, I don't necessarily see these as spontaneous movements, but I think that they are examples of a very militant working class that exists uh, in the global south, and I think that there is a propensity for industrial workers to be more militant based on their uh, social conditions, uh, based on their work lives and so forth, and I'm not just talking about male workers uh, that uh, uh, would be critiqued by many people, including Kathy Weeks and others, but I'm talking about female workers, for instance, many of the workers in the Pearl River Delta of China are women electronics workers, I and mean, we all know about the Foxconn uh, case, uh, but you know, women tend to be more skilled than men in that region. Um, okay, so I, I also like to say that I don't mean to diminish the importance of uh, workers in the global north in any way. The book wasn't about that. In fact, I discussed to some degree the, you know, the, med the nature of global north workers as being uh, exploited and their conditions have diminished uh, to a great degree. Uh, but that wasn't the focus of the book. If I want to write another, the next book I'd like to write on is on agency and the importance of having a political movement that is aligned with uh, workers' movements. Um, so anyway, I was trying to anticipate the questions and uh, thank you for coming and I look forward to hearing anything. Thank you.